The .NET Core podcast is supported by our listeners who have become patrons. To see a full list of the patrons, or to join them, head over to .netcore.show slash patrons. Hello everyone and welcome to the .NET Core podcast, an award-winning podcast where we reach into the core of the .NET technology stack and with the help of the .NET community, present you with the information that you need in order to grok the many moving parts of one of the biggest cross-platform multi-application frameworks on the planet. I am your host, Jamie Kaprogman taylor and this episode is a slight departure from the norm. As this is episode 100, I thought it would be fun to have an AMA, or an Ask Me Anything. Listeners on Patreon, Twitter, and LinkedIn were asked to submit their questions for this episode, and you're about to listen to my answers to those questions. I, I swear it'll be much more fun than I'm making it seem. There are around 50 links in this episode, so do make sure to navigate through to the full show notes via the link in your podcatcher. Once there, you'll find a full transcription, an embedded player, and all of the links mentioned in this episode. Just one thing before we start, I'm going to be reading slightly editorialized versions of questions, and when I do read them, it'll sound like this. I'll use the same formatting if I need to quote any kind of external resource, but that's about the only thing which will be different in this episode. So let's sit back, open up a terminal, type in .NET New Podcast, and let the show begin. I'd been thinking about how to celebrate the 100th episode of this show since around February of 2022, and I even wrote up a post asking for ideas over on the Patreon page for the show. The gist of the post was, Episode 100 is due to drop on June 8th, 2022, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on what that episode could contain. I'd love to do something fun for you all, but I'm currently out of ideas. Maybe I could take questions from you all. Maybe I could give some stuff away. Maybe I could make a clip show of some of everyone's favorite episodes. I'm really not sure, but I'm open to ideas. Please let me know, either as replies to this post, via a direct mail through Patreon, via the contact page on the podcast's website, or via a DM on Twitter. I'm really glad that I didn't go with the clip show idea. I can't think of any examples of clip shows across either podcasting or TV shows that anyone actually enjoyed. Clip shows usually take tons of work to create and are often disliked by everyone who consumes them, mostly because people see through them for what they are, filler. Anyway, I then followed up that Patreon post with a Twitter poll on April 17th, 2022, asking, We're still figuring out the minutiae, but we're thinking of hosting an Ask Me Anything for the 100th episode of the podcast. Folks would send questions in and they would be answered on an episode of the .NET Core podcast. Does this sound interesting? With the incredibly scientific 16 responses, a very small percentage of the show's followers on Twitter, and 93.8% of those pointing to yes, I sent out another tweet and quickly built the 2022 AMA submission page. And the question submission page is live. If you have a question that you'd like to be included in episode 100 of the show, then please send it in at the link below. Questions can be on .NET, podcasting, or anything really. For those of you who haven't seen the 2022 AMA submission page, the rules were pretty simple. Feel free to ask any questions on .NET and related technologies, podcasting, or anything else. I will do my best to get an answer for your question and include it in the show. And with that, episode 100 was born. So let's take a look at some of the questions and my answers to them. Remember to navigate through to the full show notes as there are a lot of links in this episode. But one last thing before we start, a few of the answers in this episode relate to things like concentration, physical and mental health, and taking care of ourselves. I am in no way an expert on these matters, and am purely giving advice based on my own experiences, so please take it with a pinch of salt. Our first question came from Russell, and they asked, I am Russell, would you rather fight a horse-sized duck or 100 duck-sized horses? Really? Friend of the show Steve Worthy had a question about where I think the development industry might be going. Where do you see the developer industry going in the next five years, and how will that change how you and others work and collaborate on projects? 
This is a great question for a number of reasons, but chief among them being that I could put my futurist hat on and dream a little dream. So come with me whilst we take a trip into the near future. I think that the future is going to be a combination of both low-code, no-code and source code generation. Low-code, no-code is great for business folks who want to quickly prototype a process or an application idea. Most systems allow users to drag boxes, which represent functionality, around on a screen and connect them together. Kind of like Scratch, but a little bit more involved. Once you've created your process, you can hit a button and it'll run just like any other program. Most low-code, no-code systems aren't currently ready for prime time. And by that, I mean I wouldn't recommend replacing a piece of your business infrastructure with something made using it just yet. But that's mostly because the tools used to build low-code, no-code applications can't easily deal with the nuance and fuzzy logic which sometimes applies to the rules that you don't realize are in place in your infrastructure and operations. For the time being, you might still need a developer to turn that low-code, no-code system into a battle-tested production-ready system. But a low-code, no-code app will likely get you somewhere between 30 and 50% of the way to a functioning app. Source code generation is another thing which is already happening. The .NET compiler does a fair bit of this for us, and it will come on in leaps and bounds. The basic idea of source code generation is, you can either provide a template or a set of rules and say to the compiler, using this template or set of rules, go look at the shape of that data and generate all the code to deal with it. This has the ability to save countless hours of an engineer's time, because they don't have to type out the same boilerplate code over and over again. Source code generation can even generate test code for that code too. A programmer, coder, engineer, or whatever title you choose, will usually only spend 30 to 60% of their time actually typing in code, with the rest of their time spent on things like reading code, debugging, attending meetings, reading bug reports, and helping their colleagues. So anything we can do as an industry to help make engineers more productive during that 30 to 60% of their time is a net positive in my book. That's my opinion on what the next five years look like for the development industry anyway. Thanks for sending in the question, Steve. Bolty wanted to ask about my thoughts on Java and C Sharp. What do you like most about Java? And why do you hate .NET? I really like the double question here. And as someone who has dabbled with quite a few languages in my career, I feel like I could continue answering this question for hours and hours. I haven't used a great deal of Java, but I have used Kotlin, which is based on Java and uses the JVM. I've done some Android app development with Kotlin and found it really nice to work with, especially as I didn't have any experience with Xamarin at the time. What I really like about Java is the fact that there are millions of libraries available for it, and that they're all compatible with Kotlin and the other JVM languages. I also really like that it's very syntactically similar to C-sharp, so converting a codebase from one to the other is relatively simple. I mean, imagine converting a codebase from terse C++ code into C-sharp, and you'll know what I mean. And since Java and C-sharp are so similar, I can usually do the conversion in my head. Plus, we wouldn't have the wonderful Noda time library for .NET were it not for the Joda time library for Java. Before I get on to what I dislike about .NET, please remember that this show is not created by or affiliated with the .NET team. As for what I dislike, and I feel like hate is a strong word, about .NET, I don't like that it's taken almost 20 years to get enough syntactic sugar and compiler help to be able to reduce boilerplate code down through things like implicit usings, file scope namespaces, and minimal APIs. I fully understand that there's a lot of compiler magic and code generation going on in the background, but I feel like this could have come sooner. Then again, perhaps these innovations were held off until modern .NET was ready. On the other hand, just look at how the .NET community reacted to the bang bang or double exclamation mark operator. Maybe we aren't ready for these kinds of innovations. I mean, take a look at the classic Hello World in .NET Framework, and the same codebase in .NET 6. In one .NET Framework, you have 11 lines of code, with only one line of code actually being useful, whereas the other, .NET 6, is only one line of code. I mean, technically it's two because there's a comment, but still. 
I am all about doing what I can to help people get started in development, and the simplification of code by removing boilerplate greatly helps with that. If I'm trying to help someone who's brand new to writing code, I no longer have to explain what a using statement is, what a namespace is and why we use them, what a class is, what static void main means, and what string square bracket square bracket args means. They can simply run .NET new console and get all the code they need in one simple, easy to read line. By simplifying it, you immediately lower the barrier to entry for new folks while simultaneously making it so that we all have to type less. Because you only have so many key presses in your fingers and I only have so many key presses in mine. Not only that, it reduces eye strain and memory strain. We no longer have to rely on code folding to hide the bits of code which aren't immediately useful. And it means that the code itself is shorter and more concise. But why did it take so long for .NET to get here? Check the show notes for examples of Hello World in both versions of .NET. I won't bore you by reading them out in the show. And tell me which one you think is easier to read, especially if you're newer to .NET and you haven't really seen old .NET code. So in summary, I really like Java's and Kotlin's huge number of libraries. And I really dislike that it's taken as long as it has for .NET to be able to reduce boilerplate code. Thanks for sending in the question, Bolty. Carl asked about starting again. If you were to start your dev journey from day zero, zero based index because we're not monsters, would you still pick .NET? There are a lot of choices today, and arguably the ecosystem has moved on a lot. Can .NET compete to attract enough new talent in a very competitive field? This is a very compelling question, because there really are a lot of options for folks getting into development. You can't argue with the almost non-existent barrier to entry for JavaScript. If you have a browser and a text editor, you have everything you need to get started. And that's what a lot of coding boot camps use to get people up to speed very quickly. After all, JavaScript and NPM and React, Angular, Vue or Svelte is all you really need to get started with something very quickly. I'm not sure that C-Sharp and .NET can easily compete with that. After all, until .NET 6, you had to explain a bunch of stuff before you could even start to learn anything useful. Take the classic Hello World as an example. I use this example all the time, but it's literally the first thing you learn to code. In JavaScript, it's a single line. In Python, it's a single line. In previous versions of .NET, it was upwards of 11. It's currently only one in .NET 6. But is Hello World a good yardstick for measuring the complexity of a programming language or framework? Once you start to do anything vaguely useful, the difficulty curve of .NET ramps back up again. You have to start talking about classes and functions and lambdas and all that fun stuff. Sure, these things are there in JavaScript, but you don't need them in order to start making something useful. You can start by writing purely procedural JavaScript and work up to things like classes, arrow syntax, hoisting this, and lambdas. But I don't think you can do that so easily with c and .NET. Then again, I got started with BASIC and x86 Assembler, which is like learning simple English and ancient Greek in the same lesson. I think that if I had to start again, I honestly wouldn't know where to look. My opinion of how I'd start again is also rather coloured by the fact that I also have all the knowledge and experience that I do. I have a feeling that I'd start with JavaScript, but knowing what I do right now, I feel like I'd likely want to start with something like Go. It's functional enough, it handles references and addresses automatically, for the most part, and it's built for concurrency. But I say that knowing what these words and phrases mean. Would I pick .NET? Honestly, not sure. Thanks for the question, Carl. Mark over at RJJ Software, i.e. the editor of this show, had this series of questions on equipment. Standing desk or sitting desk? Preferred operating system? What piece of tech would you not skimp on buying? Keyboards, etc. Micro keyboard or full keyboard? So I prefer to sit, but that's largely because I spent most of my programming career sitting down. I also used to stand a lot during my job at college, when I worked in retail. A combination of standing for 8 hours and the uncomfortable shoes I had to wear has put me off of standing for long periods of time. I know that standing is likely better for me, but I just don't want to. As for my preferred operating system, would you believe me if I said that I don't really have one? 
I move between Windows, Mac OS and Linux distros on an almost daily basis. I'm very much of the opinion of use what works for you and what you're productive with. I've had my last argument, hopefully you can hear the bunny quotes, about which operating system is better decades ago. They all do the same things, to a certain extent, in almost exactly the same ways. So it's really down to what the user likes and whether the tools they need are available for that operating system. There's no point in using an OS if the tools you need aren't available for it. What piece of tech wouldn't I scrimp on? Uh, scrimp here means to buy cheaply. I would say that a good quality keyboard, a comfortable chair if you're going to sit, and adequate lighting are a must. Most people interact with their computers with either a keyboard or a mouse, so they need to be comfortable to use, and they need to feel right. I prefer the use of a mechanical keyboard, but that isn't to everyone's tastes. Why do I use a Mac? Well, the mushy keyboards actually hurt my fingers after a while. If you're going to be sitting in one place for eight hours across a day, hopefully with plenty of breaks and moving around in between, then you really need to buy a chair which suits your needs and supports you in the places where you need support. This might mean going out and buying a designer chair for thousands of dollars, or it might mean buying a bargain bin chair from the local office supply store. It really depends on what your needs are. I would advise trying a bunch of chairs out before settling on one, if you can. As for micro keyboards versus full keyboards, I'm guessing you mean things like 10 keyless, 75%, 65%, 60 and 40% keyboards versus a traditional 104 keyboard. I'm a big fan of the full size keyboards. I've had 10 keyless keyboards, uh, for those who don't know that's a keyboard without the number pad, and I found that I needed the number pad way more often than I thought I would. So I prefer the full sized 104 keyboards. Thanks for the question, Mark. A listener who wishes to remain anonymous wanted to know about the genesis of the show. I haven't been listening since the start of the show, but I'd love to know how it all began. So how did you come up with the idea of this podcast? Back in 2016, yes, the story of this podcast goes back six years, I'd started blogging about .NET Core. This was way back in the pre-1.0 time frame, and I was writing about some of the cool, interesting features and some of the drawbacks that .NET Core had. I didn't have a Windows machine back then, so being able to run .NET applications on my Linux and Mac OS boxes without having to use Mono and GTK Sharp was a big step up. So I'd been writing about .NET Core for about two years, and the articles were getting longer and longer. The first blog post I ever wrote about .NET Core was 514 words long, and some of the longest posts were around 3,000 words long. I'm not a very good writer, so writing 3,000 words in an entire demo application every week started to take its toll on me. I had been chatting to some of the folks over on the Coding Block Slack channel, a uh, pro tip if you don't listen to their show, you really should, and I'd said something along the lines of how there aren't any .NET specific podcasts. There were shows which were .NET specific, but none of them were all about .NET Core. After a long conversation with some amazing people, I realized that I'd found a small corner on the market. So one Saturday in May 2018, I went to a local coffee shop with my MacBook Air. I bought a coffee, got sat down with my laptop and opened Visual Studio Code. Several hours later, I had a room temperature coffee, which had sat undrunk, and plans for the first 20 episodes. The plans were basically bullet points in a markdown file, but there was a plan. I then took a couple of hours each night to see if I could flesh out some of the episodes, moving from bullet points to paragraphs. Soon I had the first six monologue episodes written. I spent a little time playing around with the content and moving some words around, then got my Blue Yeti microphone, uh, something my brother had given me, and I had been using for live stream experiments and some of my first podcast guest appearances. I decided to record a reading of one of the monologues. It wasn't bad, but it wasn't great either. It needed something. So I headed over to Fiverr and paid a musician to create some music for the show. My requirements felt really rather clear. I'm looking for an intro song for my new programming podcast. I can hear the tune in my head, and I know which chords I'd like. Uh, it would have to start in C-sharp and include F-sharp somewhere. But I can't play it. I know that I'd want an overdriven or distorted electric guitar sound for it, and for the bass to be root notes, maybe with a little flair involved. 
something with a similar feel to Learn to Fly by Foo Fighters, yet with a similar sound to Don't Feed the Trolls by Jonathan Colton. The reason I picked those two quotes, C sharp and F sharp, is because the topic of the podcast will be two computer programming languages with those names. The musician created the intro music you've heard at the start of the last 100 episodes and sent it over within 48 hours of me placing the order. So I had a monologue and some music. I had almost everything I needed to create episode one. It wasn't long after the first episode dropped that people started reaching out to see if they could guest on the show. So after only a week, the show's format needed to evolve to become an interview show. I released the first eight monologues between the first few interview episodes, and there are still some monologues unreleased, because you never know when you might need to drop an episode quickly. But I won't be releasing them anytime soon, as I really like interviewing people from the .NET community. I hope that answers your question. If you're enjoying this show, would you mind sharing it with a friend or colleague? Check out Podcatcher for a link to the show notes, which has an embedded player within it and a transcription and all that stuff, and share that link with them. I'd really appreciate it if you could indeed share the show. But if you'd like a few other ways to support it, you could uh, leave a rating or review on your podcatcher of choice. So if you head over to .net core.show slash review, you'll find loads of ways to do that. You could consider buying the show a coffee. The buy me a coffee link is available on each show's show notes page on the website. This is a one-off financial support option. You could become a patron. This is a monthly subscription-based financial support option, and the link to that is included on each episode's show notes page as well. I'd love it if you could share the show with a friend or colleague, or leave a rating or review. The other options are completely up to you, and are not required at all to continue enjoying the show. Anyway, let's get back to it. Maya Resch, and I apologize for mispronouncing your name, asked about a playlist mentioned in a recent episode. Can you please share the sounds on music playlist that you mentioned in your last episode? Thank you. The last podcast in question here is episode 97, Developer Productivity, with Dan Clark. In that episode, I said vaguely the following. If I'm reading something and someone's talking to me, I can't do both because... And I'm sure my friend Paul Seal is going to hate me for saying this. I'm an auditory learner. My attention goes directly to the sound that's happening. So if I'm reading and I want to take something in, I know that I have to sit in either silence or have a playlist of music that I put on that provides some light background noise. And I'm happy to share this playlist with people if they're interested. Do get in touch. Whenever I need to concentrate, perhaps if I'm studying or if I need to get deep into flow state for a piece of work, I'll put on one of the compilations released every quarter by the folks over at ChillHop. I've bought their compilations on Bandcamp, and they usually pay what you like. They also have a page on their website that'll let you stream their entire back catalogue for free. I find their combination of simple beats and chord progressions, and a lack of vocals to be soothing, and they help me to get into a flow state. I've been using their music for this purpose for around four years, so it might be a combination of practice and conditioning or habit at this point. I do wonder whether a subconscious part of my brain simply goes, Chill hop. Time to concentrate then. I also make a point of actually getting up and walking over to a different seat when I'm about to put on any of their stuff. I sit there for a few minutes with some of their music playing and just breathe. It's kind of like a meditation, I think. I'm not actively listening to the music, but I'm focusing on my breath. I try to get my breath rate down, but increase the depth of each breath, if that makes sense. After a few minutes of this, I'll either head over to my desk if I'm working, or to my study place if I'm studying, and get on with the task at hand. Playing their music through headphones works, but I prefer the bigger, more rounded, room-filling sound that my speakers can create. Uh, The benefits of working from home, I guess. Plus it gives the skin of my ears a chance to breathe. I also have a pair of bone-conducting headphones for when I'm working in a space with others and want to be able to listen out for if they want my attention, or for any environmental sounds. I hope that answers your question, Mayorish. And again, I'm sorry for mispronouncing your name. Fandomil asked an interesting question about getting distracted during the hard parts of development. 
When I encounter a difficult problem while programming, I tend to get distracted quickly as checking news on Twitter is just one click away. How do you keep the focus on solving the problem when the first thing you come up with is not the right solution? This is a great question, and I feel like you can solve this by arranging things so you fall into the pit of success. I take a multi-pronged approach when it comes to keeping distraction at bay. First, I'm lucky enough to be able to have a few computers. One for writing code on, and one for socials, emails, video games, music, and all the other personal things which get in the way of doing work. I also make a point of never signing into social accounts on the work machine. If you're in a position where you can't do this, consider setting up perhaps a separate user account on your computer specifically for getting the work done and apply those same rules. As a side note, if you're ever given hardware by the company you work for, never do things on it of a personal nature, including socials, emails, e-commerce, or any of that stuff. I also make a point of putting my phone on the other side of the room that I'm working in. Another one of those working from home benefits, I suppose. This way, in order for me to check my socials, I have to literally get up and walk over to my phone. I also make a point of getting up and walking around every hour or so. I found that taking five minutes to walk around the house or to head outside and look into the distance can help me stay focused on the task at hand. From what I've read on the subject, attention is something that you have a finite amount of, and as you go through your day, your focus level drops and can only be replaced by taking a break or having a nap. Let's say you start with 100 focus points, and that your first task requires 30 focus points in order to complete. This will leave you with 70 points for the rest of the day. I've found that as I get down to around half of my total focus supply, say 50 focus points, I start to flag. I usually find that this happens at around lunchtime, so I make a point to go out for a walk during my lunch break. Just once around the block is enough. Throw some headphones on, put your shoes and coat on and go for a five minute walk. Try not to think about anything relating to work whilst you're out of the house, as you want to take in the fresh air and enjoy your time. When you get back, you'll feel a little refreshed and ready to hit the ground running, as it were. The other thing that i found can help is getting some good quality sleep. Now, first thing, I am not a doctor or a neuroscientist or any kind of sleep specialist. But from what I've read about sleep, if you don't get enough, you won't be able to concentrate. And this is something I'm sure we've all felt. That feeling like your head's full of rocks and that you're an actual zombie just shuffling through life. But how much sleep is enough? This is definitely not something I can answer for you, but I've been tracking my sleep using a Fitbit, although there are other devices on the market, for long enough that I've found that 8 hours of sleep is just about the sweet spot for me. Also, please note that I said sleep, not time in bed, because there is a difference. Let's say that you set an alarm for 6am and you go to bed at midnight. A sleep specialist would say that you've had 6 hours of sleep opportunity. This is the amount of time that you've spent in bed that you could have spent asleep, but you probably haven't because it takes us time to fall asleep. During those six hours, you may have only slept for two or three. What you need to do is figure out how much sleep you need to not feel like your head is full of rocks, then give yourself at least that much sleep opportunity plus 30 or 60 minutes. Then set that time in stone and plan the rest of your day around it, not the other way around, which is what most people do. It's not a simple answer, and I'm definitely not an expert in sleep or sleep patterns, but I hope that helps. Also, thanks for the question, Fandomal. And this question comes from Russell. Wait, did we already have one from them? I would like you to answer my question. Would you rather fight a horse-sized duck or 100 duck-sized horses? Okay, let's think about this logically. Let's say that the average duck is about half a foot tall and that most horses are around five feet tall. A five foot tall duck is actually rather an upsetting visual, whereas a half foot tall horse is probably one of the cutest things I can think of. But imagining a hundred of them rushing at me is rather upsetting. I'd rather not fight anything, but I think that there would be a higher chance of me being overwhelmed by 100 horses if they came at me in the stampede, regardless of their size. I think that I could charm and potentially tame a giant duck. And failing that, I'm pretty sure that I can run faster than a duck, even at maximum waddle. There's a phrase I never thought I'd say on this show. Maximum waddle. 
Mark over at RJJ Software, again the editor, had this question on competition in the podcasting space. Do you see other podcasters as competition? Absolutely not. Success to me isn't having more downloads or more listeners than any of the other shows, especially since folks like .NET Rocks, Coding Blocks and the Six Figure Developer Podcast have been around way longer than this show. Um, You should totally listen to each of those shows, by the way. My measure of success for this show is just one listener, one person, walking away from an episode of this show knowing just one more thing than they did 45 minutes ago. An investment of between 45 and 90 minutes of someone's time is a lot to ask for, and if they get just one thing from that investment, I'm really happy. Thanks for the question, Buck. Another listener who wishes to remain anonymous asked, What are your three tips for getting better at writing code? This is a great question, and it's something I talk with junior developers and mentees about a lot. My three top tips are, 1. Read code. 2. Read books. And 3. Learn how your brain works. So firstly, reading code. There's a wonderful piece of advice given to aspiring authors, and it goes, If you want to be a good writer, read. And the great Stephen King expands on this. If you don't have time to read, you don't have the time or the tools to write. Simple as that. And this extends to writing code, too, because there are only so many ways to solve the same problem, and we're almost always working on similar problems. So why not spend a little time reading code? You're going to spend a large part of your career reading code written by other people, and the you from yesterday is almost certainly another person. So you need to be reading through code in order to get better at writing code. But what code should you read? I would say that you should be reading code either in a language you don't use, or written with a framework that you don't usually use. That being said, the code has to be in a language that you're either familiar with, or that is similar enough to the ones you already know. You don't want to be struggling to read it because you're not familiar with the language or idioms. You do need to pick a code base which is of high quality and solves a problem that you're interested in though. So I'd recommend taking a look around on GitHub, GitLab, or any other public Git service for code which is solving a problem that you're interested in, has a large number of contributors or stars or similar, and is easy for you to read. If you're a beginner React developer who has no experience with the C programming language, then perhaps deep diving into the Linux kernel would not be an optimal use of your time. But looking at Svelte or Vue code might be a good idea, They're solving similar problems, using a library which is similar to yours, and a language that is either the same or similar. Getting really good at reading code is a skill in itself, as you'll likely spend time reading documentation or code samples for the APIs and libraries that you'll have to interact with for your projects. So taking time to figure out how to read code is essential. Let's talk about reading books. I'm about to mention a large number of books, For a list of them and links to their Goodreads pages, check the full show notes. You could read The Pragmatic Programmer, The Phoenix Project, The Mythical Man Month, or any of the other legendary reads from our industry. And you really should. There are tons of developer book must-read lists out there. I've already mentioned some above, but here come some more recommendations. The Imposter's Handbook, Code Complete, and Software Craftsmanship. And the list goes on and on and on. But you should also be reading outside of your development industry too. You'll find that people outside of development are solving similar problems to us. They're just not using computers to do it. For example, The Life-Changing Magic of Tidying Up by Marie Kondo teaches clean code principles without talking about computers at all, as does Essentialism by Greg McEwen. The Five Dysfunctions of a Team by Patrick Lencioni teaches us how to communicate with others by allowing ourselves to be completely vulnerable. I'm about to mispronounce his name, but The Goal by Eliyahu M. Goldratt and Kaizen, The Key to Japan's Competitive Success by Masaki Yimai, both teach us about DevOps and were written in the 1980s. In fact, both The Goal and Kaizen are mentioned by name several times in The Phoenix Project. Who Moved My Cheese by Dr. Spencer Johnson teaches us about Agile and was written three years before the Agile Manifesto. 
And my wild card book is always Game Engine Black Book Doom Edition, written by Fabian Sangelgard. And not just because I'm a fan of the video game Doom, or indeed just of video games. This book works as a commentary for the Doom source code, which is completely open by the way, you can go get it off of GitHub, but also a commentary of the development of Doom from a technical perspective. For a book on the same topic, the Doom video game, but from a less technical perspective, check out Masters of Doom by David Kushner. Game Engine Black Book Doom Edition covers the hardware limitations of the time, the different design paths that John Carmack took the engine in, why it was built the way it was, and commentary on some of the home console ports of the title. I legitimately believe that any developer with more than a few years of experience under their belt, and an understanding of any C-based programming language, will be a much better developer after having read Game Engine Black Book Doom Edition, or indeed the Doom source code. You'll come out of it with a much greater appreciation for performance, design and code quality. For example, one of the reasons that Doom is almost trivial to port to new devices, such as the time it was ported to a pregnancy test, is because the code is so well engineered and all of the concerns are separated. It applies the solid principles, which weren't formally introduced until 2000 by Robert Martin. And if you're not sure of which books to read, consider joining a book club, listening to the Coding Box podcast as they do whole episodes on individual books within our industry, or signing up for the Storygraph as their recommendation service is pretty good. And finally, learning how your brain works. Everyone learns differently. I'm an auditory learner, so I learn best by listening. But there's both kinesthetic, which means to touch or to do, and visual, which means seeing and watching. Part of learning how to learn is about figuring out the best style for you. But once you've done that, if you can learn how your brain works, you'll be able to generate little hacks for your study time. In the programmer's brain, Dr. Felina Hermans compares the way that we take in new information to how a computer works. I also discussed this with Dr. Hermans on episode 96 of the podcast. We have inputs, our eyes, ears and such, and each input has a buffer. Information is stored in the buffer before being transferred to working memory and then transferred to short-term memory. Most people can hold somewhere between four and seven pieces of information in their short-term memory. So short-term memory is kind of like RAM. You hold things that you're working on in your working memory and pull things into it from either long-term memory or short-term memory. You can think of working memory as kind of like a CPU cache It's the parts of knowledge that are actively being worked on right now. And long-term memory is kind of like a hard disk or a storage device. Just like the different bits of memory in a computer, you can have wildly different access times for the different types of memory in your brain. Working memory is generally the fastest, but it's almost always the smallest amount of memory possible. Long-term memory has the slowest access time, but has the most storage space. And short-term memory falls somewhere in between. With the above in mind, you can diagnose a problem that you have when you are learning or applying knowledge that you are attempting to learn. Here's a quick summary of how the different types of confusion are related to different cognitive processes. Lack of knowledge means an issue in your long-term memory. Lack of information means an issue in your short-term memory. Lack of processing power means an issue in your working memory. With this knowledge, you can approach both your learning and your work, because you might be learning a new to you code base or a new API or framework as part of your work, and optimize for what makes sense for you in that given moment. So let's say that you know Link, and you are learning a library which uses Link syntax. You can use and augment your pre-existing knowledge about Link in your long-term memory, and you can rely on the fact that a reference of sorts to it will be stored in your short-term memory. And you can start working through those examples. Each of those examples will be brought into your working memory and combined with the reference in your short-term memory before being pushed back to long-term memory for storage, i.e. just like a computer. That was episode 100, which featured a number of questions from the community of listeners and my answers to them. I'd love to thank all of the listeners for sending questions for the episode. Without you, this episode wouldn't have any content. And I'd like to thank all of the listeners. 
from those who've been here since day one to those who dip in and out of the podcast feed. And of course, I can't forget to thank the wonderful people who supported the show via Buy Me A Coffee and Patreon. Thank you all, seriously. Here's to another 100 episodes of the show, at least. Be sure to check out the show notes for a bunch of links to some of the stuff that I covered and a full transcription of this episode. The show notes, as always, can be found at .netcore.show and there will be a link directly to them in your podcatcher. And don't forget to spread the word. Leave a rating or review on your podcatcher of choice. Uh, head over to .netcore.show forward slash review for ways to do that and to reach out via our contact page, which is available at .netcore.show forward slash contact. And obviously to come back next time for more .net goodness. I'll see you all again real soon. See you later, folks. The Dotnet Core Podcast is a production of RJJ Software Limited.